Today I talk about uh, some uh, the, the two uh, big floating point calculations that were involved in this project. Uh, so, see, remember that D stands for you know, invariant distance, uh, and we have the set S, which uh, is inside gamma bar, and we hope of its generators for gamma bar, and we construct this uh, fundamental domain. Uh, <coughs> and as I explained in the, my previous lecture, if everything has gone well, we'll actually be able to see that F is a fundamental domain for whatever group S generates. Okay, I'll call that I'll call that gamma. So there are two things that we need to calculate about the fundamental domain: uh, its radius, measured from the origin. It's a directly fundamental domain based at the origin, so that's the reasonable thing. And and its uh, volume. Now its volume is what would be called the covolume of gamma. That's my. Yeah. I mean, very close to the definition of covolume. <coughs> now, that radius is needed for several things, uh, uh, but as, as I explained in the previous lecture, you need it to be sure that uh, your group is really discrete and that, uh, <coughs> that uh, what's written up there is Fs really is a fundamental domain for gamma. Now, this group gamma, which is generated by S, is certainly inside gamma bar because the elements in S are in gamma bar, <coughs> and if the volume of the fundamental domain is uh, finite, then obviously its index in gamma bar is finite. Uh, however, all of that is enough is not enough to say that it is all of gamma bar. It might be a, a piece of gamma bar. It might be one eighth of gamma bar. And it, the way that we check this is to check the uh, <coughs> The, the covolumes, if the covolume of gamma and the covolume of gamma bar match, then <coughs> we, uh, we can be sure that gamma is really all of gamma bar. And we're really looking for gamma bar, so this is what we want. <coughs> now, uh, the values for our desired group are known through uh, more theoretical calculations. In, in fact, this is what comes out of uh, Prasad's volume formula. <coughs> Uh, on the other hand, to get the uh, covolume of gamma, we have to measure how big this fundamental domain is, and that is not done with theoretical calculations. It's done uh, by uh, integrating the volume form yeah. numerically. Okay. So these are the two numerical calculations we need to do. <coughs> um, in several places here, it's going to be convenient for me to use a sort of uh, polar coordinates, so uh, if we have a z in the ball, write it as tu, where u has norm 1. So t is like the radius, and u sort of tells you the direction. It's the, uh, now, for uh, fixed uh, u, if you look at that ray, tu, so here in the ball, this is just the simplest possible sort of thing. That is actually a geodesic. <coughs> And uh, the distance uh, formula is, is given there. Uh, that, I believe that formula has already been on the board before. Uh, it's it's uh, slightly distant, different than the distance that uh, the Julien used. It, there's a factor of two in it. Uh, you notice that the distance is scaled like that. Uh, makes it <coughs> a, 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 comparable to ordinary Euclidean distance uh, near the origin. So. <coughs> Then, as was explained the other day uh, by me, uh, if you consider the, fun, the, the part that of the fundamental domain that, ex that lies along this uh, ray, uh, it's going to be like that. So this is what's called a star-like domain, the entire thing. Okay. And why is it that the fundamental domain stops at this point? Well, at that point, there must be some other translate of the origin, which starts to be closer to uh, the points on the ray than uh, the origin is. So it's gonna, going to be some specific, well, some specific element, g of zero, that means that we stop here. Okay. So in any case, <coughs> uh, I want to give a name to, uh, 
the uh, value that corresponds to the stopping point, and that's t of u, okay? The, fun the piece of the fundamental domain in the ray goes out to t of u, where uh, t we can take t of u between zero and one. Now, if t of u is equal to one, this means that we're going right out to the boundary, which means our fundamental domain is not co-compact. So there are, in fact, uh, lots of interesting examples where this is what happens, but not co-compact examples, and our examples are supposed to be co-compact, so if that happens, uh, it is a sign that everything is wrong and we need to go back to previous parts of the calculation. Uh, <clears throat> so assume that that's not true. Assume that it's always uh, strictly less than one. And, uh, and then we really need to use this function t of u for both calculations. Now, <clears throat> as to the radius, uh, it's more or less immediate. Uh, uh, to find the radius, we need to find the point on the fundamental domain, which is the furthest away from the origin. So, that's a question of finding where this uh, value t of u is the biggest, right? That's, that's where you go furthest from the origin before you leave the fundamental domain. Uh, and because there's a relation, well, the radius was defined in terms of invariant distance, whereas this value t0, the maximum of the t of u's, is, is uh, Euclidean distance. I, you have to apply a function. But basic, basically, it's just a question of calculating that maximum. That, that will tell you what the radius is. So this, it's clear that one needs to know what t of u is. <clears throat> so the question is, uh, how do you calculate t of u? Well, for this, <coughs> uh, it's useful to uh, have, have a, a formula for the distance between any two points. And uh, this is a formula. Again, it is identical to one that uh, Julien put on the board, up to a factor of two. Uh, uh, and, okay, so I actually put some calculations here in the slides, but they're, they're extremely elementary. So, so, you know, what is the possibility uh, for uh, three points? Uh, zero, zeta, and w, that the distance uh, between z and w is less than the distance is the distance from z and o. This would be something that would keep us out of a fundamental domain if w was one of the translates. We just have to work out what that means numerically. And using the formula for the distance, uh, you do a little calculation and another little calculation, and you arrive at, did anyone find the pointer? I'm kind of pleased, actually, because I like this thing. You find that formula. This is the condition that, well, you know, just, just is expressed here by you know, very elementary calculation. <clears throat> so there, there is something uh, uh, relevant about this. Uh, uh, if you fix W and ask the, what set of Z's satisfies that condition, you get something which is a convex in the Euclidean sense. So we actually use this later. <coughs> uh, so uh, we only need to do this for one point at each distance from the origin. So I choose that simple point, that's zero, and do the calculation. And the, form and the formula uh, matching that uh, comes out as follows. So this is supposed to be thought of as an, equation, as an inequality for z. And uh, as you see, it only includes, it contains z1. So and uh, as an equation for z1, this is the equation of a disk. And uh, so we see that, uh, in fact, not only is this region complex, it's, it's, it's a disk for the z1 variable across all of c for the z2 variable, definitely convex. We're really only interested in those pieces of it, the piece of this thing which is inside the ball. OK, we intersect with the ball. If we wish, it's still convex. So. So now we fix a, uh, some particular g and s, and uh, let this w here in this picture be g of o, and also assume that uh, this is a geodesic, assume that this is going out to the, well, oh, if I'm going to draw it like that, it really should look straighter. Okay, so I will draw, redraw it straight. Here's zero. 
here's u, and we're interested in the point t u. You know, as we go along here, we want to know when it is that we start being closer to this than we were to that. Okay, again, it's it's quite an elementary calculation. Uh, based on the formula in the previous slide, we find that it <coughs> comes out to a quadratic uh, inequality in t, and uh, one knows how to solve quadratic equations, and uh, <coughs> one uh, discovers, uh, uh, you know, one can calculate tg of u, which represents uh, precisely the point where the two distances are equal. This would be tg of u times u, and the thing about that is that this distance and that distance are equal. Beyond this, we're going to be closer to that. Before this, we'll be closer to the origin. Uh, it isn't actually given that there is such a point. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, w could be here on this side, and even if it's on this side, uh, it can it can easily happen that uh, that uh, that that tg of u is one. Uh, for instance, in that quadratic equation, you might discover that the roots are imaginary. That that's that shows you that in fact, this particular <coughs> point g of zero is not putting any condition on it. Okay, so what are we supposed to do in order to get the fundamental domain? We want to put on conditions like this, not for one G and S, but for all G and S. So that means that uh, after calculating TG of U for each G, we just take the minimum, and that tells you how far you can go along this ray before leaving the fundamental domain, and so it calculates the thing which uh, I had called T of U earlier. S is a finite set, calculating the minimum is not a difficult calculation. The set sometimes has a few thousand elements. More than that, Donald, I don't recall. So it's not a calculation that you can you know, do in a nanosecond, but you can certainly do it in a millisecond. Uh, OK, so relative to this con Okay, that shows that we can actually compute t of u. Okay. This is u, this is where we're leaving the set, and this point here is the point t of u times u. That would be the origin there. This would be u. <coughs> so, uh, supposing that uh, we have three points which lie not, not in, uh, whoops, not in the ball, but on the boundary of the ball, and suppose that uh, V lies on the arc between U and U prime. Okay. Nothing. <coughs> so I will draw this as though the dimensionality was a little lower. Here's U, here's U prime. Here's V, somewhere in the middle. This, this is the picture. And then uh, we suppose that for each of the two endpoints, TG is less than or equal to M. Okay, so I am assuming that for this and for this, uh, TG, uh, the TG value, the place where you pick out the fundamental domain, uh, actually, not the full fundamental name, just TG, just relative to a particular group element G, uh, is less than or equal to this value M. M here, M here. And <coughs> so relative to the point uh, W equals G of zero, uh, what we know is that uh, uh, W is closer to this. This is closer to W than it is to the origin, and also this is closer to W than it is to the origin. And that was exactly the thing which, when you check it, turns out to be a convex condition. So we can say the same thing. Whoops, no, no, we can't because I've got it wrong. Oh, my picture is the wrong picture. Oh, 
I mean, of course, it doesn't bother me at all. I knew what the right picture was, but it certainly doesn't make life easier for anyone else. Um, so, okay, again, here's W. Uh, although it appears not to be, not to be the case, uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, no. Yeah. We have that the distance from here to that, that this point is closer to W than it is to the origin, and also this point is closer to W than it is to the origin, and under these circumstances, by that convexity, we knew the same thing is true for all the points along this line, okay? And the rest of the proof is just like this, you know? We go, uh, <coughs> we look at the ray out to V, and we discover that, uh, you know, also that point is closer to W than it is to the origin, and if we want to go out distance m, that's actually a little further, so we see that it's true, okay? So this means that if we have the value of <coughs> Tg of u and Tg of u prime, that throughout the entire interval, it never gets bigger than, than those two, okay? And it's, yeah, kind of, one could express this more, <coughs> uh, more precisely, but, but this, this is what we need. It's, it depends on convexity. Well, this will show up. In fact, it will show up quite, quite immediately. So, <coughs> uh, of, of the two algorithms, for reasons that I will explain later, it's perhaps a little more delicate to make sure that we've calculated T0 correctly. So, I'm going to uh, explain the algorithm that I used. Uh, uh, I, I haven't written this in anything like pseudocode. It's just a list of points which explain more or less how the algorithm works. Uh, so, before we start, we decide that we want what accuracy you want for our calculation of T0, and then you do it as follows. You, you construct a list of simplexes on the boundary, uh, and you initialize it so that uh, <coughs> uh, those simplexes uh, cover the entire boundary. So if it was the two sphere, you could you know, use a, an octahedron. It, you know, for three spheres, what we have, you have to use something different, but it could be the equivalent of the octahedron in, in that dimension. And for each vertex in this decomposition of the boundary, you calculate uh, T of U, and the maximum of those values is T max. Now, <clears throat> as we, of course, this may not be the true maximum because we've just used a few values. Maybe, maybe the maximum is somewhere completely different than those vertices. Now, as we go ahead with the algorithm, from time to time, we're going to take one of these uh, <clears throat> simplexes and divide it into eight smaller simplexes. This is because we're in three dimensions, that's what's convenient to do. And when we do that, we get some new vertices, and every time we get a new vertex, we calculate the, the T of U for that vertex, and we use it to update T max. So T max is a, you know, a computer program variable, not a mathematical variable. It changes in time as the algorithm goes on. So it means the maximum value we've found so far. Okay? So now we go through the uh, simplexes on the list one at, th one at a time. And so supposing that we're looking at one of them, here's what we do. Uh, we look at the central point of that simplex. And for that central point, we find uh, an element of capital S which gives us a T of U. So <clears throat> for the central point of the simplex, that particular value, that particular element G is the one which is determining the uh, the, the, the length of, of, of how, far you, along you, how far you go along the geodesic. <clears throat> and then using precisely that G, you uh, control it for each of the vertices of the simplex. Let's see how many of them will be. There will be five vertices of the simplex in that dimension, but you know, however many there are. Now, it can easily happen that for each of the verti vertices uh, that were less than or equal to T max plus epsilon, but that, of course, means that for all the points in that simplex, you're less than or equal to T max plus epsilon. And this means that I don't have to worry that any points in that simplex are going to seriously increase T max, at most by epsilon. And so I just drop it. I just forget, you know, remove it from the list. It's not there. That's all I do. Well, this may or may not work. Uh, it depends on whether my simplex does or does not contain the key point where the distance is largest, or one of the key points. So if, if, if this fails, what you do is you subdivide it and you put the new simplexes at the end of the list, you drop the old simplex, 
and you keep going. So sooner or later, uh, this, this algorithm terminates. Uh, uh, and the, list, the list empties out and the algorithm terminates. So why does it empty out? Well, you were, you know, <coughs> uh, you, you get to the point where you just have a very few simplexes and for the vertices of the, you know, for the elements u and those simplex, the, uh, the uh, t of u is, is very close to t max. Yeah. Or, so, and you can, you can be sure that for none of them will you go beyond t max. So this is a you know, standard sort of algorithm here. We uh, <coughs> pinch down on the point that's interesting. Okay, so <coughs> as far as the algorithm goes, I mean, this, 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 is, uh, this is a lot more rigorous which, than what I did at first. What I did at first is I just choose, chose a million values for u and used all of them and took the maximum of those. But of course, there are more than a million values for u and maybe the bad value is, you know, is between the ones I chose. I mean, this is a lot more careful. However, there's still a failure in mathematical rigor here because I didn't use interval arithmetic. I just used ordinary double precision real, real floating point arithmetic, which means that it's conceivable that somewhere in uh, the calculation, uh, the, 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 the errors built up. Uh, so, <clears throat> but not all that conceivable. I mean, if we're working to 15 places, uh, it's, it's not as though the <coughs> old results are being used to calculate the new results, so uh, it's probably not too far off. And, and all I did was to uh, add a millionth to the answer as a uh, uh, you know, little bit of extra security. And uh, okay, so that's a, that's a failure of mathematical rigor, although I... I well, looking at the way the numbers came out, it seems extremely unlikely that it actually gave us false results, but I want to point this out. I don't, I don't want anyone to think that we are hiding this. Well, and, and no, that's, that's a bad way of putting it. I don't want to hide this. I want, want, want it to be clear. Okay, so how do we go about calculating the volume of H? Now, that doesn't mean the Euclidean volume. We want to calculate the invariant volume. That's what gives us. And we need the formula for the <coughs> Volume element, which is up there on the board, uh, I've expressed it in these polar coordinates. So uh, for uh, t, which is the Euclidean distance from the origin, we get a certain factor. That's uh, this, this thing here. Uh, for u, the uh, element on the boundary, we use ordinary uh, measure on uh, the three-dimensional sphere. Uh, that has, as it happens, that has measure 2 pi squared. Uh, we have to normalize it with exactly that factor, and this I will explain later. <coughs> uh, and now we do the uh, integral. So if we're integrating over f, we integrate first uh, dt, and for each value of u, there's an upper limit t of u, you know, as shown in the picture. And we have to, as it happens, the integral dt is uh, you know, very easily done, elementary calculation. But the, this, this function is certainly not something where I can uh, do the integral uh, over, uh, over the sphere uh, exactly. <coughs> it's a piecewise continuous function, uh, fairly complicated, but worse than that, I don't, you know, don't have any good formulas for where the various pieces are. So that uh, calculation is done numerically. And I did that with a you know, very simple, naive, uh, numerical integration calculation, and, uh, and that's how I did it. So, so again, this procedure lacks mathematical rigor, but whereas in the previous one, I can reasonably be worried that somehow I went wrong, I really can't with this one for a reason that I will explain. Uh, see, the, the thing we're calculating, which is just the co-volume of, of, of gamma, uh, has to be a multiple of the covolume of gamma bar. We're hoping that it's exactly that, but if it isn't that, it could be twice that or three times that if gamma is, is just a subgroup of gamma bar. So uh, here, here's a number from an actual example. The true covolume, as calculated with Prasad's covolume formula, is one-third for gamma bar. And so this means the volume of F is going to be a multiple of that. Okay, what does the numerical integration give? Well, it gives this number. You see, it's not one-third. 
But uh, to me, <laughs> to imagine that this is just an awful approximation to two thirds, uh, you know, we are beginning to talk about theology. I really don't think that there's the slightest chance that this is a bad approximation to two thirds. It's obviously an approximation to one third. Uh, okay, but. Supposing someone who is more theologically minded wants to correct this error, well, not error exactly, but if they want to be even more sure, well, again, that the exact same convexity lemma used in the exact same way would enable you to construct a rigorous upper bound on the integral, okay? Because what it tells you is that you can dominate the uh, size of T of U on an entire simplex just by looking at the vertices. So if what we want is an upper bound for the integral, this is exactly what would be useful. <coughs> okay, so uh, as to failures of mathematical rigor, I have confessed all. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Gopal has asked me a number of times how I managed to calculate the uh, uh, volume form. Uh, <coughs> The, the real question there was uh, how did I manage to calculate the, uh, uh, the, the constant out front, 2 over pi squared? Uh, I don't know why Gopal is so curious about this, because if there's anyone who knows how to calculate that number, it, it is he. And, but uh, but I, 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 I suspect that, that he, he doesn't trust that I've done it uh, correctly, and, and, and that's why he wants to see it. But in any case, uh, Although what I'm now about to say is, is uh, entirely an exercise, uh, I, I decided to spend the other half of the lecture, you know, explaining how you can do it. Now, be <coughs> before I go on, though, I, I should point out that uh, in, in Gopal's uh, paper from 1989, the covalent formula, he actually has a formula for this constant. Uh, for, you know, for the purposes of the user, the, the formula doesn't present any difficulties in the sense that there's anything difficult to calculate. It presents difficulties in the sense it's a very general formula for any semi-simple group. So you have to look at the paper and see what all the notation means. And, but in fact, in a relatively simple case like this, you, uh, don't, it's, you don't have to work too hard and you can just get the answer that way. So that would certainly be one way of getting this answer. And I believe I did it that way once, but I, I can't quite remember. On the other hand, <coughs> as I'm about to explain, yeah, one can just go ahead and calculate it by hand. I mean, this is so a little exercise, which probably. So uh, in order to do this, I have to be a little more concrete. Uh, so uh, u of 2, 1 will preserve that form. And the uh, ball that we're looking at is the projectorized version of the points with uh, inner product positive, if I use that signature, and then uh, this thing here, z1, z2, 1, corresponds to z1, z2 in the ball because of the signature. Uh, this will, in fact, have positive uh, inner product with itself exactly when the, the thing is in the unit ball. As I said, this was explained. Well, we're, we're here at a ball question conference. I doubt that there's anyone who needs to know anything about this. I'm just fixing the notation. <clears throat> OK. so so. Uh, to work out the invariant volume element, uh, we, we, we start with some convenient volume element at zero, and then we use group elements to uh, shift that volume element to everywhere else in the ball and uh, <coughs> to do a concrete calculation. Now, how many of you have done this exercise yourself? You need to use a particular matrix GR, and the one which I choose to use is that one, okay? It's, uh, <coughs> uh, and then what are, what are these next few lines do? I, I put it in the slides. If anyone wants to read the slides later, it's elementary calculations, which probably only a few of you can follow in, in real time, but there's certainly nothing difficult about it. So if you start with that three vector and apply GR, you get an answer. And you can then translate that to say that if you have W1, W2 in the ball, that the translated vector is Z1, Z2, given by certain formulas. Uh, and you see, you calculate what the image of the origin is under that map. It turns out to be the hyperbolic tangent of R and zero. Those are its coordinates. And then, because we're interested in volume, we calculate the Jacobian 
of this map, the Jacobian between the Z and the W, and we get this answer. Uh, we want to evaluate that at W equals zero. <coughs> and then I'm interested in what factor that gives me on ordinary Euclidean four volume. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, because what I have here is, uh, is the complex Jacobian. Uh, uh, I actually don't look at the Jacobian itself, but rather at its uh, norm squared, which you know, passes me between. Well, I mean, that's what you have to do to <coughs> look at the scaling on volume when you multiply a complex number by something. Okay? So this very last number, which is the hyperbolic secant of R to the sixth, is, gives the ratio between Euclidean volume uh, four volume for Z and Euclidean four volume for W. And clearly, in order to get the invariant four volume, we need to put in a factor that exactly cancels that. And uh, I, I can never do this calculation without thinking a little about whether I put in that factor itself or its inverse, but in fact, it's the inverse. And uh, so we discover this, that uh, for that particular Z, the factor that is desired is is, is this, sixth power hyperbolic <coughs> cosine. Uh, that must be multiplied by ordinary Euclidean volume. Why, why, why is the ordinary Euclidean volume enter? I repeat, that's because my calculation with the Jacobian gave me a ratio of volumes for ordinary Ge Euclidean volume. And uh, then if I set uh, hyperbolic tangent of R equal to T, the formula comes out in this one. Okay. Now, <coughs> Uh, rotations in U of two preserve both Euclidean and invariant volume, and therefore uh, whatever was true at that particular point is true for any point where modulo z is t, so that's the truth. And if I use polar coordinates, uh, z equals t u, uh, well, Euclidean polar formulas like this, it's just like ordinary polar coordinates in four dimensions, and then if I want the invariant volume, I put on that form, and voila, I've arrived at this. It's a completely elementary calculation. Uh, and well, there's a reason why I wanted to go through the details, but uh, uh, possibly there's someone in the audience who, who's never seen a calculation quite like this, but, uh, it's a, but I doubt it, it's particularly since we're at a <coughs> ball quotient conference. But anyway, you do the, that's, a, that's, the, that's the calculation. So what about the normalization? So the normalization works like this. The, the uh, Hertzberg proportionality principle says that we should do this same calculation not on, uh, on the compact form of the, of the ball. That's the, pre, that turn, that's the projective plane over C. <coughs> we should uh, arrange for the uh, two volume forms to match up and then also the proportionality between volume and Euler characteristic will match. Okay. If, um, well, all right. So we so that means if I really want to do everything based on the deficient, I have to go back and redo this calculation for uh, uh, u of three and the projective plane. So <coughs> here is the point where you begin to see that there, there's a very strict analogy. I mean, okay, the form is different; it has all positive entries. And we look uh, at what can be described as the same set, the projectivized version of this, because in this case, uh, every vector is, you know, has inner product positive with itself except for zero. And you, then you projectivize it. So we can do exact, this exactly what we did with the other one. And uh, we can do the same calculations as before, but uh, we need to use a slightly different matrix. In fact, the only difference is this. You know, instead of hyperbolic cosines, we use ordinary cosines. And we put in this minus sign there. And you do all those same calculations that I did before. And uh, naturally, they're going to go through in almost exactly the same way because everything's about the same. And uh, the answer you get, this is the invariant volume in the compact case, is almost exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is uh, the other formula had a minus here. Okay. Uh, that's why I actually put a bit of the calculations on the board. I mean, if you see them on the board, you, you could, even if you've never done them yourself, you could, it's, it's, it's perfectly obvious that the compact calculations are going to go very closely to the non-compact calculations. Uh, now, this formula actually only gives us, it's, it's only working on the affine plane. It's leaving out the line at infinity, so 
I suppose for some purposes that would be unpleasant, but we just want to integrate this form. So a set of measure zero is of no interest. We don't care about that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I want to integrate this form over the entire uh, <coughs> projective plane, but I, I, I choose at this point to uh, change my definition. I throw in the, what turns out to be the correct constant, two over pi squared uh, <coughs> uh, before integrating, and then I integrate. So uh, let's see, in this case, you know, it's not a fundamental domain, it's all, all of PC. So we just go from zero to plus infinity. Uh, and therefore, we, the only integral we need to do is the integral dt, which uh, one can do. And doing it, uh, one discovers that it's 1 over 2 pi squared times that. And then if you integrate uh, this, you get 2 pi squared. So the whole thing comes out 1. And that's, of course, exactly why I chose <coughs> that constant instead of some other constant. So this means that for the projective plane with the volume form normalized as above, uh, characteristic, uh, Euler characteristic three corresponds to volume one. And what the Hertzberg proportionality principle says is that in this case, but also all sorts of other cases, what, you, uh, what are the confirmation symmetric spaces, that if it works out like that for the compact uh, <coughs> Hermitian symmetric space, it also works out like that for the non-compact Hermitian symmetric spaces. Uh, so, we use, I claim that, that this thing here is the corresponding form if we're working, whoops, ah, error, error. Here I say non-compact case, but I left the comp in. That's a mistake. The non this should be the non-compact, yeah, that's just dv, simple. So then also in that case, Euler characteristic three should correspond to volume one, so that means fake planes with this uh, measure ought to have volume one, which means the covolume of the fundamental groups should have covolume one, okay? So we can work it out in the, for, the project, for the ordinary projective plane, and then uh, <coughs> that tells us. So the only problem here is that, uh, not a problem, but there's something, a calculation that hasn't quite been done is, am I really sure that this is the form on the, on the ball that corresponds to <coughs> uh, the form that I used on the projective plane. Now, in our, <coughs> the rule there is, if you look at the origin of the ball and the origin of the plane, the two forms should be identical. Yeah. However, <laughs> that's a little odd because one form is a form on the tangent space of the ball, and the other one is uh, at the origin, and the other one, the tangent space of the projective plane at the origin, and uh, <clears throat> you might imagine that, that those were not really comparable things, and this is, is exactly the point, and I, you wrote this down, didn't you, in your talk, that in fact, there's a sort of a canonical identification between those two tangent spaces, so we can say what it means for <coughs> the, uh, two forms to be the same at the origin. Not all the tangent spaces, but strictly the ones at the origin, okay? Let's see. So, so well, if, <clears throat> if I were to go into this at any length, it would be uh, extremely tedious for the 75% you know, of you who understand these things and probably not all that useful for the 25% who don't. But <clears throat> I'll put a few things on the board. Uh, both of these groups, we have two different groups, U21 and U3, but they both lie in GL3C, okay? So call GC the complex group, G the group for the ball, G compact the group for the projective plane. These in order, these two groups, I, I guess it's their intersection, but certainly K, this thing, lies inside both of them. And then here on the right, we have the corresponding uh, Lie algebras. So in order to be able to compare these two tangent spaces, it is fundamental that uh, the two groups lie inside a common complex group, and likewise for the Lie algebras. This is, without that, it would be very hard to see how to compare tangent spaces. Okay, 
So, <clears throat> uh, so we look at this, this set P and it's, uh, and, what, and also at what happens to P when you multiply by I. Okay, so in P I have, uh, <clears throat> what, are you, what, do you, what do you call them? Mm. Self-adjoint matrices uh, of a very special form and IP, if you think about it, it's anti-self-adjoint matrices of, of the same form. <clears throat> and the thing is that the uh, Lie algebra, you know, for our, the group we really are interested in, uh, UT1 is K plus P, okay? K being the uh, Lie algebra of capital K. And to get the one for the compact group, uh, it's k plus i b, i p. So you just have to multiply p by i in order to pass from the one Lie algebra to the other. Now also, uh, the origin of g mod k here, which is the ball, uh, has a tangent space which can be identified with p. That's because k is the Lie algebra of, uh, of, of, of capital K, and capital K is what we're dividing out by. So if we move in a k direction, the origin doesn't shift at all, but if we move in a p direction, it does. And in fact, one identifies uh, <coughs> the tangent space at the origin precisely with p. You see the dimensions are right. This has four, p has four real dimensions, and this has four real dimensions. <coughs> and exactly the same sort of thing works out here. Okay, so clearly, uh, uh, since there's not much difference between p and IP, this gives me a way of identifying the two uh, uh, tangent spaces. Uh, and so I did even one further little calculation, although I'm not sure exactly who this is good for. I mean, how exactly do we get the tangent vector at the origin B of C to? Well, okay, we take, say, that matrix, which is in P. We consider uh, the exponential of this Oops, this is a mistake. The bars should be in the Z's, not on the R's. Uh, you take the exponential of that and you apply it to zero. Well, the exponential is a long series, but if we're taking DDR, we really only need to look at the first two terms, so it comes out like that. And if you apply that to zero, you get RZ1, RZ2, and uh, the derivative of that respect to R is Z1, Z2. So <coughs> uh, through uh, calculation with two equal signs and a mistake, uh, we discover that, in fact, uh, that particular matrix in P corresponds exactly to the <coughs> tangent vector Z1, Z2. Not a, not a big surprise. It's the most obvious thing that you could imagine that it would. And if you do almost exactly the same calculation, uh, working in the compact case, you discover that, uh, that to this vector in IP, you get that vector, that tangent vector at the origin Okay, so if, we, so if we use this whole system to identify the two tangent spaces, it means that uh, <clears throat> up to possibly a factor of i, which I might or might not want to include, uh, in fact, the, can the canonical identification is just the identification you get because the complex ball is something in the complex uh, plane and the complex plane is inside the co complex projective plane and you just use that uh, identification, that's all you get. So this means that, in fact, having gone through all of this, we see that the identification we want is the easiest one that anyone would ever have thought of. But in, in, in the statement of the Hertzberg proportionality theorem, I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is the recipe. You, okay. Well, that's all. So this means that uh, <coughs> the following two volume elements uh, uh, actually match at the origin, just at the origin. The origin is when z is equal to zero and the two Euclidean things match and so these two match and so this means that those two particular forms match in this sense and uh, that's what the definition requires or the, the, the hypotheses for the proportionality principle require. so our little calculation is complete. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever done this exercise for yourselves but uh, <coughs> you, you see that uh, there's not, not much to it, just, just a bit of, bit of calculus. Uh, okay, so I stop there.